Okay, hi everyone. My name is Josh. Welcome to our number two Abacus tutorial. Today we talk about beams. I hope you all attended the lecture in which the theoretical background was covered because in this tutorial I will focus mainly on the application side. We'll have a short overview on the beams that you can use uh, in our Abacus software. We do a small recap on some of the um, aspects of certain types of beams and um, finally we'll end up with an example. So to be more precise we'll talk about uh, Euler Bernoulli beams and Timoshenko beams as it was presented to you in the lecture whereas Timoshenko beams can include warping, uh, Euler Bernoulli beams cannot. Um, in Abacus we have some more special or let's call, call it more advanced classes of beams, so-called hybrid beams, which can be Euler-Bernoulli or Timoshenko type beams and um, so-called pipes. We'll talk about this later on. Um, finally, we'll wrap up with a modeling recipe, I would call it, that I created to give you a general guideline on how to create a model uh, using beams. And finally, we'll do an Abacus example. I will talk about this example briefly here in the presentation and then we will redo all of this um, live in Abacus. All right. So talking about beams, uh, one has to understand that it's basically a reduction of whatever problem you want to model to one dimension. So beams only know about their um, main axis, so to say. So this is a mathematical perspective to beams. Uh, we talked about this in the lecture too. Um, however, we can, this behavior in this main axis can be defined by various cross sections which have a huge um, influence on the overall behavior of the beam. The use of beams is however not restricted to one dimension, so to say. So you can use beams in 2D and even 3D, so they can move out of their main axis in the other dimension. So that's sometimes uh, something that is confusing people. So down here we see a typical example. So when you model bridges or pipelines, um, truss-like structures and so on and so on, it's quite common to still use beams in finite element analysis or let's say in metal forming if you have certain support elements of um, your machine or in some other cases that some part of the things you're forming or sometimes deforming. Think about a um, crash of a car that you can have some structures that can be easily reduced to one dimension. This is where beams come into play and definitely are a huge um, advantage. So the nomenclature in Abacus, we'll talk about this in more detail, uh, B or P um, for beam or pipe. Um, then the in plane, if you go for a 2D simulation or a 3D simulation, so this basically the second number gives you the dimensionality of the problem you're using the beam in. Um, then the interpolation um, scheme and some additional information such as open section which is used for warping and hybrid elements. Uh, we'll talk about this later on. Okay, um, Euler Bernoulli beams, the theory you have been presented in the lectures, so I will briefly go over the most important aspects of it. So the first point is very important. Plane cross sections that are initially normal to the beam's axis. So I will draw a small sketch here. So if this is the beam, this is so to say the beam's axis. Remain plane and also normal. So you have a 90 degrees angle here and this plane so to say, no it's not it's not very well drawn. So this is stays um, plane. So in case we think of a deformed beam, then this plane, so if this here is again the new beam's axis, you will have again a 90 degrees angle here 
and that the cross-section plane um, remains a plane. So we do not see any uh, distortions, so they remain undistorted and that it stays normal to the beam's axis. This is a very strict assumption in Euler Bernoulli beams. This makes it easy to calculate, but think about any real-world applications where you can really say, yeah, this is the case. Usually you can say Euler Bernoulli beams are more related to small strain analysis where such assumptions um, can be justified. And however, um, due to, to increase the accuracy, they are automatically using cubic interpolation because otherwise they're very cheaply to calculate. And so we can spend a lot of computational time here on the interpolation. Nowadays, they are restricted still to small strains, but relatively large rotations, but not super large. So this is, this is like a tricky extension to small theories. Um, and also, um, generally, it's used to model slender beams. That means that the cross-section is less than 150th of support distance. Um, or axial length in order to render transverse shear as negligible. So support distance, think about you have a certain uh, structure like this and you model like this one beam uh, being placed on top of it, then this is your so-called support distance. It doesn't have to always be quite literally the distance between two supports. It can be other features and this is roughly a guideline. So if, if you look at the cross sections and it's less than 1 15th in diameter of your support distance, then it's uh, okay to go for Euler Bernoulli beams. And the transverse shear um, is also related to the assumption, assumptions on top of here that you do not take any informa information um, uh, like this into account. So this is very simplifying reality. Um, in Abacus, you see uh, cubic interpolation all the time. This defines Euler Bernoulli beams in, in 2D and in 3D. We talked about the nomenclature before. All right, um, the Timoshenko beams. Plane cross sections may not remain normal to the beam's axis. So again, let's draw this deformed beam and you can easily see that this is probably more realistic um, that, um, due to some uh, transverse shear strains and stresses which can be accounted for using, whoops, uh, using Timoshenko beams and this is why you can also um, render relatively thick beams in which uh, effects like that you don't have 90 degrees here anymore. So I shouldn't draw this, so this is not 90 degrees here. Um, uh, where this plays a role, you can model Timoshenko beams. And uh, since the theory to calculate the deflection of the beam is a little bit more advanced and uh, can also account for large strange strains and large rotations. Um, you usually use only linear or uh, quadratic interpolation, which is uh, quite sufficient uh, in most of the cases. Um, moderate torsional strains, yes, it can be also depicted. There is a limit to how much you can twist such a structure around this axis. So moderate, you have to find out on your own, but usually you quickly see if you reach the limit uh, in terms of your torsional strain. So elements, you see uh, linear quadratic interpolation, linear quadratic interpolation in 2D and 3D respectively, and the pipe type elements are also based on Timoshenko theory. And what's also quite cool is that Timoshenko beams are available in Abacus Explicit, uh, which is typically used for crashes. So think about any, anything you want to do a crash test uh, using FEM, then uh, this is the way to go. So usually there's no 
difference between Timoshenko beams and Euler Bernoulli beams in terms of the naming within Abacus. So you have to um, think about the interpolation. So one and two is Timoshenko and three is uh, Euler Bernoulli beams. And as you uh, might know already, more is not always better. So in this case, the one and two, the linear and quadratic interpolation usually gives you better uh, results. Okay, warping. It's an interesting aspect that allows the deformed cross-section. Okay, let's redraw this to not remain planar anymore. So, and this is not a weird um, three-dimensional cut as you might know it from other mechanical engineering drawings, this is really, I tried to indicate that really cutting the cross-section, that your cross-section may not be a straight line anymore as it uh, used to be. i delete this again and maybe indicate it a little bit less extensive. So particles move out of plane. That is, so plane was the straight connection between this dot and this dot, and any movement in this or in this direction is exactly defined as warping. And you can show that it's only useful or that the effect of warping um, is only common in open cross sections. So if we look from this side, for example, and have a cross section that maybe looks like this. It's called an open cross section because it's not closed uh, on this side here. So in such type of cross sections, uh, warping is definitely way more pronounced than in closed sections. So the theory of Timoshenko beams is only extended to warping if you choose open section beams. Um, if you choose open sections and then you have to use this type of um, beam elements. So in some cases, yeah, you might find structures like this and including warping definitely uh, is a huge advantage because this includes also some type of um, failure modes and this is quite important to include at this point if you're using open cross sections. Okay, hybrid beams. I would say it's a rarely used class of beams. Same applies for the uh, continuum and uh, 3D elements. We'll talk about this in later tutorials. Um, used for extremely slender beams. So, um, for example, I've um, come across an example where they um, try to model how if you have a ship that's carrying uh, a pipeline and then if this is the ground of the, the, the sea floor and then how this pipeline is so to say placed from the ship so here's the, the water um, onto the ground of the floor um, then you can easily see that a pipeline is super huge. So, and they want to model it for different structures of the ground. So, they basically used a very, very long um, uh, pipeline. So, and then they, yeah, reached higher than this weird. I don't actually know where this ratio comes from. So, this is given also in the manual. Um, and it was, um, it also included a lot of large rotations um, and the pipeline is usually considered quite rigid um, because you don't want to have any plastic uh, deformation on the pipeline. So there are some examples where you can use this special hybrid beams, they are computationally uh, more costly um, because they treat the axial and transverse forces independently and um, so they store more information, they do um, independent calculations of these values and you ha have hybrid for both classes, Timoshenko and Euler-Bernoulli beams. 
So this is more or less an extension to the uh, classical two theories. But I would argue that it's, uh, especially in metal forming, it's rarely used. I just wanted to uh, still highlight some aspects of this class. Uh, last but not beams, um, pipes, uh, hollow thin walled circular cross section um, uh, in which internal pressures lead to high levels of hoop stresses. Yeah, so this is exactly the case when you're talking about pipes. Um, so um, the pipe element can have a radial expansion of the cross section. This is usually other types of formulation cannot um, have such a feature. So the second one more or less is the most important one. And um, yeah, there might be some special application where you, I don't know, want to fold uh, or if you do some uh, hydroforming of uh, tubes and um, then it might be of interest. But nowadays you would usually also do this in a 3D uh, continuum body and not using a fixed single pipe element. So there are definitely some application of this type of element. They are very, I would call it special purpose um, elements. I wanted to just inform you about this.